Buongiorno, buongiorno a tutti, benvenuti. Parliamo in italiano e in inglese, avete la traduzione simultanea e quindi procediamo così più speditamente. Buongiorno a tutti, grazie di essere qui. È per me un grandissimo piacere introdurre questa, questa conferenza, questa conversazione. So very welcome to all of you. I would like to thank you so much for your presence this morning. We have Amitav Ghosh, Professor Ghosh. Thank you so much for being with us in this uh, Orto Botanico, the most ancient uh, botanic garden. And it is a great pleasure to have all of you as far as the environment, to human beings are concerned. In 2016, we, you published a book the uh, Great Bloodness, which is connected to the climatic changes, so the Great Derangement as well. So we were talking about our uh, awareness as uh, corresponds to the capacity to tell the stories. And we have a great opinion, and uh, we have uh, read a lot of your um, novels but you have changed the scenario here you have told us that change it was really a climate change and it was a great disruption this crisis is connected to the imagination so it's a very important book and the fact that you're with us today in that context of the celebrations of the 800 years of the university is great so you're one of the most important writers in the world. You've had a lot, you've had a lot of awards, uh, the award for literature in, in uh, the UK, but also uh, you are a scientist, researcher in anthropology, social anthropology, but not only that you've been using in your texts, in your research as in Egypt, for example. So you travel a lot, you write a lot, we follow you all the time and i think in the last two books you can find and you will find very recently which are very different actually two different uh works jungle nama which is uh, for the first time connected to an incredible story and very well adapted for youngsters as well um it is the native people of the mangroves people, uh, the story of the mangroves uh, population, how to interact with nature. And it has been introduced in the uh, Turin uh, Fair book. And also another book which will be published in next autumn is about the uh, this very specific uh, knot and uh, all the injustices and uh, terrible events which have occurred um, in the past and all you know nature and we do we do hope that you uh, will have you as well in the future so today you will make a brief presentation, so apart from your future book about nutmeg, so not only talking about nutmeg, but uh, the non-humans can talk, can speak. This is your topic. So can non-humans speak? This is our topic today. And we make the distinctions beyond with all the other uh, human beings. So thank you so much, Professor, for being here. Uh, you have the floor. The floor. E benvenuto. Grazie, grazie. Un grande piacere per me essere qui con voi. E grazie a Telmo per l'introduzione. Allora, ma Io, uh, io leggerò uh, le uh, uh, la lettio in uh, inglese.
Can the non-human speak? In many systems of law, the legal definition of human rests on the ability to speak. Hence, it would seem to follow that non-humans are by definition excluded from the realm of those who speak. Yet the matter is not as easily settled as it may first appear. For the question, can the non-human speak, conjures up a number of other queries. For example, can all humans speak? The answer is clearly no, because there are many beings who are indisputably human, but who, for reasons of disability, age, mental condition, and so on, cannot speak. Conversely, it's also true that a person who is unable to use language does not, for that reason, cease to be a human being. Similarly, we might ask, who are the humans who speak? What, for example, is the process of elimination that allows certain people uh, to address audiences and not others? The moment we ask this question, it becomes evident that the act of speaking is also an act of silencing or privileging some forms of communication over others. Yet another fundamental question that arises in this regard is who and what is human? Today, the definition of human is often tied to the binomial name, Homo sapiens, the wise ape, a taxonomic category that was invented by Linnaeus in 1758. The date tells us a great deal about the phrase, Homo sapiens. For example, that it was born of the European Enlightenment amidst the emergence of what we now regard as science. According to the linear definition, all members of the class Homo sapiens are a single species. Yet Linnaeus also divided the species into various subspecies, according to geography and physical attributes. In other words, even as the Enlightenment was producing the idea of the human as a single species, it was also negating that idea. Hence, many, if not most, Enlightenment philosophers believed that there existed a natural hierarchy within the species Homo sapiens, so that some races and classes were more human than others. We cannot forget that the New World, for example, was represented by its European conquerors as a world without humans, and that it was this that allowed them to attempt the mass extermination of indigenous peoples. So we are confronted with the paradox that the invention of the human went hand in hand with the process of disaggregation whereby the faculties of speech and reasoning were not regarded as being distributed equally among all humans. Needless to add, these beliefs held powerful sway through much of the 19th and 20th centuries and are with us even today in vestigial forms. So let us consider for a moment a contrary possibility one in which living things of many kinds are able, if not to speak, then at least to articulate certain aspects of their being. This is not a far-fetched far idea. We now know that trees in a forest are able to communicate with each other in certain circumstances. They can send, send help in the form of carbon to ailing members of their group, and they can warn each other about pestilence and disease, it is now thought that certain plants can even emit sounds that are inaudible to the human ear, but are audible to some other living things. This suggests that one problem with the question, can the non-human speak, lies in its wording, which rests on a term, speak, that is pinned to language, a human attribute. In that they lack this attribute, trees could be said to be mute. But in that we lack the ability to communicate as trees do, could it not be said that for a tree, it is the human who is mute? So whose definition prevails? The answer to this, again, is far from obvious. It may seem to us that because we have the ability to chop down a tree, that it is we who decide who speaks and who is mute. But many trees have much longer lifespans than human beings. Some live for over a thousand years. If indeed trees possessed ways of reasoning, we can be sure that they would be calibrated to a completely different time scale, perhaps one in which humans may go extinct or experience catastrophic mortality events. Such a world would be one in which trees could flourish as never before on soil that will have been enriched by billions of decomposing human bodies. 
So it may appear self-evident to us that we are the gardeners who get to decide what happens to trees. Yet, from a different time scale, it might appear equally evident that it is the trees that are gardening us. But perhaps this is all wrong. After all, trees and human beings are not, or not just, adversaries competing for space. They're also linked by innumerable forms of cooperation. Perhaps what is at fault here is the, is the very idea of a single species. We now know that the human body contains vast numbers of microorganisms of various kinds. We know that we could not function without the presence of these uh, microorganisms. We know that microorganisms influence our moods, emotions, and ability to reason. So if it is true that the human ability to speak can only be actualized in the presence of other species, can it really be said that the faculty of speech is exclusive to humans? It has been suggested by many biologists that species do not evolve singly, but rather in close intimacy with other organisms. It is now known that certain organisms are only able to develop fully when they encounter specific microorganisms that are not a part of their own genetic makeup. These creatures must encounter those bacteria in the world. Without those encounters, they're unable to fully realize their potential. But could it not also be said of humans that the presence of certain other species in specific moments of encounter enable them to transcend their own limitations? Consider one landmark moment in the history of human consciousness, the enlightenment of the Buddha. This event occurred while the Buddha was meditating under a bodhi tree, ficus religiosa, of which you have a very nice example <laughs> right here. Within the Buddhist tradition, for more than 2,000 years, the presence of this tree has been inseparable from the moment of the Buddha's enlightenment. This is not to say that the tree transmits illumination, or even that it is an active participant in the process. Nor is it at all the case that everyone who meditates under a bodhi tree will achieve enlightenment. Yet it has long been accepted by many millions of people that a trans-species encounter at a specific historical juncture was essential to the enlightenment of one particular human, Prince Siddhartha Gautama. And the Buddha himself believed the tree to be essential to his attainment of Nibbana, which is why millions of Buddhists consider the Bodhi tree sacred to this day. What does this tell us? It tells us, first of all, that certain kinds of trans-species associations cannot be approached as though they were processes or relationships. They are precisely encounters or events that occur at specific moments in time and are not repeatable. This means that such encounters can only be approached historically by attending to the circumstances in which they occur. Secondly, it tells us that an awareness of the possibility of transspecies encounters of this sort has always existed among humans. For we need only think of the traditions that surround St. Francis of Assisi to recognize that there are many other examples of such associations. So the true question then is not whether the non-human can speak, but rather when and how did some humans and let it be noted that the, these humans are mainly people with university educations. How did these humans come to believe that other species are incapable of articulation and agency? Italy provides an instance of interspecies relationships that is particularly interesting because Italy is, of course, and most of all Padova, the very birthplace of Renaissance humanism and rationalism. Yet, within Italy, there, is, there has always existed a deep, hidden core that resists the imposition of contemporary modes of reasoning. This was precisely why uh, the ritual complex of Tarantismo, which is founded on the belief that the bite of a tarantula spider can cause a person to be possessed by spirits, drew the attention of one of the greatest Italian intellectuals of the 20th century, Ernesto de Martino. In 1959, the Martino led a team of ethnologists, musicologists, and other experts to Basilicata, 
where they conducted detailed studies of the phenomenon of Tarantismo. The Martino was a communist and a disciple of Gramsci, and he was steeped in psychoanalytic and Marxist theory. Yet what is really interesting about his work is that he did not treat the phenomenon of uh, Tarantismo re reductively. That is to say, he did not view it as false consciousness or as a symptom of poverty and ignorance or as a neurological or psychological disorder. His analysis was extremely subtle and sympathetic. In his book, Primitive Magic, uh, in Italian, Il Mondo, Il Mondo Magico, uh, De Martino lists several instances of interspecies communication. For instance, of shamans who are known to have accurately predicted the beachings of whales and dolphins. The truth is that throughout history, humans have always acknowledged that there are certain individuals, like shamans, who have special faculties or abilities in relation to the world. This is why we, we say, for example, that so-and-so has a green thumb, or that so-and-so is good with dogs. To me, it does not seem at all unlikely or unbelievable that some of these gifted individuals should be able, with specialized training, to sharpen their faculties to a very high pitch. And if there is one thing that is universally agreed upon, it is that such specialists, like shamans, are always the product of very rigorous processes of training, initiation, and so on. However, such specialists are necessarily very few in number. So it remains true that the great majority of human beings are unable to understand or hear non-humans. Inasmuch as we hear their voices at all, it is through stories and narratives recounted by others. For example, scriptures, epics, romances, fairy tales, and of course, legends. Indeed, pre-modern stories are saturated with non-human voices. Even Shakespeare's oeuvre is filled with ghosts and beings of many sorts. Why, when we watch Hamlet, do we not stop to ask whether Hamlet really could have seen his father's ghost? It is because stories have the unique ability to create possibilities that transcend everyday reality. In watching Hamlet, we are able to share the insights of a supremely gifted human being, and we accept the possibility of this non-human voice. In other words, it is through stories that non-humans address us. That storytelling is central to human existence, is widely recognized. Indeed, we are sometimes described as storytelling animals. This is sometimes taken to be a measure of our own uniqueness as a species. In this view, it is our ability to tell stories that set, sets us apart from the other inhabitants of the Earth. But I want to suggest another, far more interesting possibility, that our faculty of storytelling and the centrality of stories in human life uh, are actually the product of our awareness of the non-human voices that surround us. Stories and storytelling are signs not of our uniqueness, but of our animality. They are remnants of our pre-linguistic selves, in that sense, they are an affront to the modern sensibility, which is founded on a belief in the centrality and uniqueness of the human. Since such a belief necessarily entails the suppression of our kinship with the non-human, this aspect of, moder of modernity must also suppress the possibility of non-human voices. This is why in contemporary literature, for example, the faintest shadow of non-human presences can cause a narrative to be removed from what is taken to be the literary mainstream. It is instead shunted off to a genre like fantasy or horror. Such stories clearly clash with the modern ideology that represents humans both as unique and the wisest of all species. In the words of the anthropologist Anat Singh, I quote, over the past few decades, many kinds of scholars have shown that allowing only human protagonists into our stories is not just ordinary human bias. It is a cultural agenda tied to dreams of progress through modernization. There are many other ways of making worlds, yet expectations of progress block this insight. Talking animals are for children and primitive. Their voices silent, we imagine well-being without them. 
We forget that collaborative survival requires cross-species coordinations, unquote. The cultural and political agenda of silencing non-human voices has been extraordinarily successful. Much, if not most, of humanity today lives as colonialists once did in their colonies, treating the earth and all our fellow beings as though they were inert resources that existed primarily to be exploited and profited from with the aid of science and technology. Yet even scientists are now struggling to keep pace with the earth as it reveals more and more forces that had long been hidden from our eyes. Forces that are now manifesting themselves in climatic events of extraordinary and uncanny violence. And as these realities bear down on us, we are waking reluctantly to the realization that the earth was never what the moderns took it for that far from being inert, it was an entity so active that we would have to reach back into a distant past to find a name for it, Gaia. We are waking to the realization that in refusing to listen to voices other than our own, we have invited doom. In our case, not just, just on ourselves, but also on many of the non-human kin that had once been endowed with voices in the stories told by our ancestors. It follows then that if those non-human voices are to be restored to their proper place, then it must be in the first instance through the medium of stories. This is the great burden that now rests upon writers, artists, filmmakers, and everyone else who is involved in the telling of stories. To us, to us falls the task of imaginatively restoring agency and voice to non-humans. As with all the most important artistic endeavors in human history, this is a task at once aesthetic and political. And because of the magnitude of the crisis that besets the planet now, it is now freighted with the most pressing moral urgency. Thank you. Grazie. Adesso funziona. Grazie Amita, Grazie. Detto, Grazie ehm, molte idee, avrei un sacco di domande, poi su questo è il collegamento tra la narrazione umana e l'animalità, ehm. però prima di fare le mie sempre priorità al pubblico, che abbiamo anche quello collegato da casa, magari arrivano domande anche da là, ma lascio prima la parola a voi, qualsiasi domanda, curiosità, commento, prego, prenotatevi qui, c'è una signora in seconda fila, adesso arriva il microfono ad hoc. Tenga su, si entra lo stesso, è forte. Ok. Thank you, I'll speak English. Okay. Come vuole. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for today's talk and of course for actually starting a discussion which is so central and thank you for thinking about an Italian example of an anthropologist who seems to be far away in time but who is so revolutionary in many senses. I have a, a couple of questions, if I may. One is, of course, the, the, the issue of non-human is a very basic, central issue. And I've heard a lot of disputes on that and against the use of non-human. For instance, I'm thinking of an Australian scholar whose name is Joseph Pugliese. I don't know whether you may have ever encountered him. He actually suggests that we stopped using non-human because even with the negation, we actually still have the human as central. And he thinks about more than human as a possible expression, which he has been working very seriously on. And that's one, I don't know, not a suggestion, but uh, maybe I'd love to, to have your views on that. And the other issue is 
uh, well, I teach British literature in this university, and we've been thinking about uh, the issue of hope and the fact that hope seems not to be uh, a key word in Europe, Western white culture. Sorry. Um, and I find hope only in native cultures, in indigenous Australia, for instance, in indigenous Canada. And they seem to be the voices, their voices are the ones who actually have always been using, working with interspecies without even thinking about the inter, because it's not even a concept. So do you think we really should somehow start afresh and decolonize the European Western, uh, in a way, deranged mind? Do you think we are, we are in, in a way, not seeing beyond the, the obstacle? We only see the obstacle. So I was actually wondering whether you have any option on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, the first, uh, your first comment on the non-human. Uh, yes, of course, people have also suggested other than human, more than human, and uh, those, uh, those phrases are often used. Uh, I, I, you know, I use non-human just uh, because it's easy. <laughs> That's all. Uh, the, uh, uh, your, your second question, yes, it's a kind of very interesting thing, isn't it, that here we are celebrating the eight, 800 years of a university which has been crucial uh, to the emergence of a certain kind of modern rationality, you know, and we celebrate that rationality and all the history that has led to its emergence, and yet at the same time, we are doing that at a moment when we recognize also that those structures of thought have, over the long, long run, been incredibly destructive, you know? And uh, we are left now with the process of struggling to find our way back, you know, to, uh, to other forms of wisdom and other forms of knowledge. Now when it's, in a sense, already too late, Siamo fini la traduzione, grazie. Altre domande, commenti, prego, prenotatevi. Prego. Buongiorno, io parlo in italiano e intanto la ringrazio per, per tutto quello che ci ha, ci ha detto. E volevo mettere l'accento su due aspetti. Uno è che lei ha affrontato nella prima parte che era quello relativo alle piante, alla comunicazione delle piante. E, mh, ci sono degli studi di, del botanico Stefano Mancuso che eh, raccontano benissimo come le piante hanno un'altra modalità di eh, leggere eh, ciò che le circonda e comunicare tra di loro. Solo è la nostra incapacità a, a renderci conto di questo che ci mette nella condizione di, essere, di sentirci superiori. E, per cui eh, c'è un altro aspetto. Credo che l'uomo in tutta la sua storia evolutiva abbia avuto un rapporto eh, più eh, diretto con Gaia, con la natura, perché attingeva le risorse e credo che il, la visione religiosa e cristiana, cattolica, che mette Dio, l'uomo, gli animali e le piante no, e, e le altre forme, ecco questa scala abbia molto influito sulla visione del mondo con una totale mancanza di rispetto. Grazie. Uh, well, uh, thank you for that. Yes, uh, it's, you know, scientists have actually been showing um, many kinds of abilities in plants for a very long time now. Uh, there was a Bengali scientist, actually, Jagadish Chandra Bosch, who, uh, working in Calcutta in the, um, you know, at the turn of the 19th century, you know, in the early, in the early 20th century, uh, he built these uh, very intricate machines uh, that could register responses in not just in plants but also metals. You know, he could uh, 
you know, he actually recorded all kinds of responses in plants. Uh, his work then, uh, you know, for a brief while, he had a lot of uh, uh, success. And then his work uh, came to be suppressed, really, if you like, by sort of, what can, I, what can you call it, sort of mechanistic science, uh, you know. So, uh, you know, so really we all know that, in fact, uh, scientists have been showing for a long time these uh, all sorts of abilities in plants. And the recent work, especially on forests and so on, uh, I find that particularly interesting on fungi and forests. And, and as you say, you know, it's a very strange thing that, uh, that especially within the sort of Christian tradition, there is this hierarchy of God, uh, man, uh, animals, and at, right at the bottom are plants. And yet, uh, you know, it's perfectly clear to me now that not only are plants much, much more important in our lives than we could ever imagine, that plants actually have us uh, completely in their grip. You know, I mean, that they've sort of formed uh, our history in so many extraordinary ways. Um, I'm actually currently working on a book uh, which is uh, based on my earlier research, and it's on the humblest of plants, uh, you know, uh, which is so humble that you probably don't have it in the botanical garden. Uh, it's actually the opium poppy. And the way that the opium poppy has really sort of seized uh, our history, it's actually a really uncanny story. I mean, now when I see these wild poppies growing, uh, I, you, you know, in a way it's a sight that really is terrifying because this is the most this is the mightiest, most powerful being that humans have ever encountered, you know? Posso riprendere la seconda parte della domanda, quello sulla visione cristiana di questa gerarchia, eh, da, che mi interessa molto il tuo punto di vista, forse più esterno. Come giudichi la svolta di Papa Francesco con l'audato sì? Eh, verso questa ecologia profonda, è un reale cambiamento rispetto a questa tradizione millenaria o no, secondo te, dal tuo punto di vista? Uh, well, uh, since you've read uh, La Grande Cecità, you know I'm a great fan of uh, Papa Francese. I think he's really the, the only major figure who talks sense on climate change, honestly. And I think Laudato Si is the best thing that's been written uh, on climate change, I would say. Uh, y yes, but what is interesting about, uh, it's interesting also that he's chosen to name himself after the most uh, shamanic of Christian saints, you know, uh, St. Francis of Assisi. But uh, uh, I, do feel, uh, I do think in Laudato Si, he does something which is actually quite revolutionary, you know, but which is very rarely talked about, and which I'm sure has enraged many conservative Catholics. Uh, that he actually criticizes that Catholic tradition of mastery over the earth and so on. You know, so I, I do think it's a text that's uh, very important and also quite revolutionary in a sense. Prego, a voi. Chi ha altre domande? Prego, una studentessa forse. Adesso arriva il microfono. Se ci sono da casa, fammi un segno, eh. Um, hello. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. I, I wanted to ask uh, you... Could you take your mask off while you speak? Yes. Because otherwise it's very hard Sorry. to... Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to ask you, in terms of uh, different ways of looking at like non-human voices, could it be an interesting place to start in terms of like children's literature? I'm thinking specifically of a novel. It's called Watership Down by Richard Adams. It stood out to me personally because very often, even in children's literature, we have anthropomorphic animals and they are animals that are speaking and doing things and like they have feelings and passions, but they are very much hu human-like, they live like humans, they wear, wear clothes. While in Watership Down, you literally have the animality of the rabbit that comes to the fore and you read an epic story that is literally about rabbits fully animal rabbits. What do you think of this kind of stories? Could they, could they be interesting as a place to start for non-human voices? 
Uh, I love that novel. <laughs> I read it when I was, uh, you know, uh, I think in my teens or something, and I just loved that book. But the interesting thing about uh, that book is that it's not really a children's story, and it was not even uh, presented as a children's story. Uh, it was really uh, presented as an, uh, as an adult novel. That's how I read it. Um, and it's, a, you know, uh, it was in that sense uh, uh, something quite unique. But should we start with children's stories? I don't know, uh, you know, uh, I think in the first place, it's a curious thing that all these non-human voices have always been pushed into children's literature, uh, you know. But uh, I think it's also important to remember that there are so many other ways of dealing with, uh, uh, you know, how shall I say, far beyond just the non-human, uh, just dealing with the vitality of things. In that sense, Pinocchio is a really interesting book, you know, because it's all about the vitality of everyday objects. You know, uh, it's, it's really kind of a very uh, uncanny uh, story, Pinocchio. Posso collegarmi a questo? Una domanda che eh, mi ero fatto anch'io, un po' provocatoria, cioè quanto riusciamo a togliere di antropomorfismo nel nostro modo no, di vedere la natura? In fondo è il nostro punto di vista, anche la distinzione human-non human in fondo usa noi come metro, quindi qual è secondo te nella letteratura il grado di antropomorfismo accettabile, no? perché ci sono anche visioni più radicali che dicono che invece dobbiamo essere ecocentrici, cioè togliere l'uomo da... Com come la vedi tu? Mi sembra difficile fare letteratura che non abbia un certo elemento di antropomorfismo. I think, honestly, uh, this idea of anthrop anthropomorphism is one of the worst ideas to emerge from science. Because, you know, it appears to be a sort of value neutral idea. But actually, what it's not. It commits you to a certain position. As soon as you commit to the idea of the anthropomorphic, you also commit to the idea, you are unconsciously committing yourself to the idea of mechanomorphism, which is that uh, all non-human things are mechanomorphic. You know, that they're like machines or, robo or robot-like, yeah. you know, follow, yeah, following, uh, following uh, Descartes. And uh, uh, so I think it's impossible to escape uh, just what we were talking about earlier. I mean, human beings have co-evolved with so many kinds of species. How is it even possible that they don't share these emotions with us? We know that they do. We know that elephants feel a profound grief. Uh, elephants, dogs, uh, so many other kinds of creatures uh, feel profound sorrow. And how could we even doubt this, you know? Uh, I, have, uh, I, I have a friend who's written a wonderful book about the emotional lives of, uh, of dogs. And she adopted this one dog, uh, uh, you know, it was one of those big uh, Bernese dogs, you know. Uh, and she could tell right from the beginning that this dog was, in fact, uh, mad. Uh, actually, her book is about lunacy in animals, you know. And actually, uh, this dog, one, she used to live in an apartment building quite high up. And one day she was coming home, and the dog literally in front of her eyes committed suicide. And suicide is a very common phenomenon among animals. Uh, parrots kill themselves all the time. Uh, you know, uh, many other, I mean, with dolphins and whales, we know. So, uh, you know, it seems to me, really, how is it possible that pe uh, people actually believe that uh, animals didn't have these emotions, <laughs> when it's so self-evident that they do? Sì, anche Darwin no, diceva siccome siamo tutti parenti sarebbe alquanto strano pensare che loro siano completamente diversi da noi poco parsimonioso Atto prego a voi di nuovo da casa ah, prego eh, qui al centro fatti vedere così te lo porta eccolo lì thank you for your lecture first of all um, and I'm sorry if my question would be very uh, simplistic, and <laughs> but uh, um, talking uh, in the everyday life with friends, uh, it is difficult for people to accept this point of view sometimes. For me, it's intuitively believable, and I agree with uh, 
uh, the communication that the all non-human beings have. But sometimes uh, people are harsh and saying, oh, do you have proof of that? And even though I know it's some, in, to an extent, uh, a sensitivity that some people have, or they don't have, but um, what is a um, great uh, ground that um, can be uh, the one in which uh, can uh, begin a communication and a healthy communication and how to address this topic uh, to someone who wants uh, scientific proof? Do you have some rec recommendations of books that uh, I can give? A, oh, you can start uh, by reading this article or forming your own opinion or how can uh, healthy communication begin in the everyday life about this topic? Well, there again, uh, you know, it's such a weird thing that uh, uh, today for something to be believable, it has to be certified by science, uh, you know, when we know perfectly well that science uh, can't uh, tell us about half the things that, uh, uh, that are in the world. But if someone does insist on that, there are many articles and uh, books on uh, especially, uh, let's say, communication between trees. I'm sure you can cite many, many, many examples. I mean, now there's a huge, but actually what is also interesting, you know, is that now uh, there are many departments uh, uh, of, of science uh, uh, that are studying, um, uh, you know, uh, animal communication, that is uh, humans who communicate with animals. Uh, and it's being taken increasingly sort of uh, seriously. And if you look up, uh, on the internet, there are innumerable videos. Uh, and it's really kind of, uh, again, uh, I say uncanny, because in fact, it turns out that people who can uh, communicate with uh, animals, uh, naturally, you can't do it with words, uh, but they do it with images, you know, and e emotions and so on. And what they often say is that, in fact, uh, animals have a much greater capacity for empathy uh, than human beings. Anche qui ne aggiungo, ne aggiungo alla, alla domanda. Um, tutto questo bisogna anche considerare il fatto che avviene in un mondo come quello di oggi in cui più del 55% delle persone vive in città. In Europa addirittura ormai siamo oltre il 70%. Cioè come si fa a recuperare questo legame con il non-human quando la maggioranza assoluta degli esseri umani vive in contesti molto artificiali e antropici? Uh, yes, I think that has really, that is really the foundation of it, you know. Uh, because, uh, you know, people who live in cities obviously are kind of completely cut off uh, from, uh, um, from the animal world, if you like. Uh, but everywhere, no matter whether it's in Italy or India or Africa or wherever, uh, people who live with animals, that is farmers and so on, uh, they are much more aware of the abilities and capacities of, uh, of animals than people in cities, you know. To them, uh, it's not at all a mystery that animals have very complex emotions and, uh, you know, complex uh, reactions and so on. C'è una domanda lì? Arriva subito il microfono. Uh, good morning, and first of all, thank you for the fascinating lecture. Um, one uh, brief comment before my question. I was struck by the fact that, and I think it's not by chance, that uh, you never mentioned the word nature, and this is very interesting. Um, but I would like to have you, uh, your opinion on, on this, that maybe one of the original scenes of Western uh, modern thinking is abstraction. We have ideologically, I think, oversimplified um, our vision of what is around us and of who we are. And now it is really difficult to bring back that complexity into our view of the world. So my question is, could we, Western society, Western way of thinking, get some help um, by recognizing and including other cultures' worldviews in our vision? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, I have uh, very deep reservations about this um, 
idea of nature, you know, and nature versus culture and so on. Because it's not just an innocent distinction, you know. Uh, so, for example, uh, when European colonists, especially British colonists, uh, colonized North America, uh, they quite actively <coughs> spread disease, you know. I mean, it didn't just happen by itself. Uh, you know, they were, they were quite active in propagating disease, which, uh, diseases to which they knew that the local populations uh, often didn't have immunities and so on. But what they would always say is that it's not we who are responsible, it's nature. Nature did it. So we can't hold, hold ourselves uh, uh, responsible for it. And this position is repeated to this day. For example, with Jared Diamond and so on, you know, they take this view that because there's a thing called nature, which follows its own laws, uh, that uh, humans have no part in it. But of course, Native Americans knew perfectly well uh, that they had weaponized disease, you know. And they always said, these diseases are bullets aimed at us, you know. In the same way, uh, you know, when... Um, the British started uh, their opium racket, you know, drug smuggling on a huge scale into China. What they always said is that, no, no, it's not our fault. Uh, there's this whole uh, sort of law of economics called free trade. That's what's doing this, not us. It's free trade. So it's exactly as you say, you know, this is one of the things that arises from the late 18th century onwards in the West, that you create these abstractions. Uh, which are actually meant solely, uh, you know, as weapons, in effect, you know. So I do think you're, you're absolutely right uh, to be suspicious of these abstractions, and I've become more and more suspicious of them whenever I encounter them. And also, uh, yes, I do think that we have, to, uh, we have to find other ways of thinking uh, about our realities. Prego. Dove siamo? Ah, ce n'è una da casa, un collegamento. Allora, è arrivata una domanda sulla chat di YouTube. E dice, ritiene che il poco interesse nella ricerca delle voci di esseri non umani possa essere correlata alle modificazioni sociali che deriverebbero dal rendere certe scoperte ufficiali mi riferisco agli effetti sulla dieta umana e di diritti dei non umani nel momento in cui si riconoscesse una voce indice di coscienza. Un po' complicata. Uh, yes. <ride> La questione è co come facciamo a mangiare qualcosa che pensiamo abbia coscienza e sia così simile a noi? But that's why you eat it. <ride> Look, uh, you know, uh, when let's say with hunter-gatherers, uh, when they hunt, uh, they always recognize that it's a profoundly important relationship, you, you know, between the hunter and the animal. Uh, in fact, especially, say, let's say, the Inuit, when they hunt, uh, when they hunt whales, uh, they always say, uh, I mean, the belief for them is not that they are hunting the whale, uh, but that the whale surrenders itself to them. And there's a brilliant researcher, uh, actually, uh, uh, at, at Brown University called Bath Sheba Demuth, who's written some very interesting stuff on this, and uh, she's actually seen. So what happens with the Inuit is that, uh, you know, the way uh, the harpoonist uh, sits at the head of the canoe uh, 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 with the spear, and uh, one by one, the whales will come up and eye the harpoonist, you know? Uh, and if they don't want to, uh, if they don't want to surrender themselves, uh, they go away. But sooner or later, there will come one, uh, uh, one whale who will wait, you know, and that's the whale that's, uh, that's killed. And, of course, it's killed with deep at attention to it, you know. So hunter-gatherers, you know, uh, most of all are the people who really are able uh, to communicate and empathize with animals. But they don't do it lightly, you know, they don't, uh, they don't kill um, an animal lightly. They do it uh, with the deepest respect uh, for the animal. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, that's, that, 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 that's how we should relate 
uh, to animals. What is really appalling is this industrial agriculture. You know, the way that, uh, you know, chickens and uh, pigs and so on are treated uh, under industrial circumstances. I mean, it's a horrifying thing. Grazie. C'è ancora un'altra da casa, prego. Um, we have a question from um, YouTube, uh, Anna Vittoria. Uh, it is difficult to accept forms of vitalism in non-humans and in objects when behind us we have generations of capitalist politics. How can we start to change this mentality in the little things? Uh, I don't think it is actually the, all that difficult uh, to accept uh, 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 vitalism, if you like. Of course, the vitalism of Goethe, <laughs> uh, who came here to study plants and so on. I don't think it, I, I actually don't think it is that difficult, and I'll tell you why. For one thing, uh, elite culture is very anti-vitalist, it's very mechanistic, It only accepts, uh, you know, something that some scientist tells them, <laughs> you know, uh, otherwise uh, it doesn't exist. But what is so interesting is that in any day, even in um, any Western country you go to, like the US or anywhere in Europe, uh, and you look at the most popular films and books, they're always all about non-humans. You know, they're about vampires and zombies and, uh, you know, Uh, werewolves and, you know, stuff like that. Or they're about, uh, you know, uh, like uh, all these action heroes of various kinds. So I think that is actually a sign of the ways in which uh, uh, the, the non-human uh, continues to completely populate our, uh, our imagination. So I, I, the second thing is that, you know, increasingly I think One, one thing that climate change has brought about is that younger people can see that all that they had been told by older generations, and in fact, all much of what they're being taught to this day is actually just lies. It's a, it's a certain ideology that perceives the world in a certain way. And now, as this, as this uh, crisis, as this crisis intensifies, Everybody can see, for example, that uh, the Earth, far from being inert, is actually very vitally alive. And along with this, we see movements arising which are fundamentally vitalist movements. You know, for example, this whole, uh, this whole rights of nature movement that you see, uh, the personhood of a river has been uh, recognized in New Zealand. Uh, There's, in Iceland, uh, they've performed a funeral for a glacier. So you can see that, you know, uh, 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 a certain kind of vitalism is not only acceptable, but, but it is coming back, <laughs> you know. Similarly, some of the most important uh, movements of resistance have been fundamentally based on, uh, on vitalist principles. Uh, in India, we have a, a long-standing uh, protest by forest peoples uh, in a region called Niamgiri, which was built upon the sacredness of their mountains. Similarly, in North America, the most effective environmental movement of all is the uh, Dakota, no Dakota Access Pipeline movement. And this was led by indigenous peoples and especially by indigenous women. And it was completely based upon the idea of the sacrality of the land and of the water. And it was accompanied by dances and rituals of various kinds. So, you know, it may seem to some that vitalism is hard to accept in everyday life, but it's here. It's always been here. It's here today and it's becoming stronger and stronger. Abbiamo bisogno anche del vitalismo in questa battaglia. Eh, abbiamo ancora un paio di minuti. Eh, volevo solo... Non c'entra col vitalismo, ma sai che poche settimane fa l'Italia ha fatto una scelta molto importante perché ha introdotto nell'articolo 9 della Costituzione italiana, quindi in uno degli articoli fondamentali del nostro patto sociale, eh, le parole ambiente, ecosistemi, biodiversità e future generazioni. Quindi non era mai successo da, dai padri fondatori che fosse cambiato un articolo fondamentale, lo è stato fatto per metterci queste parole. 
Eh, ci sono un'ultima domanda forse? C'è tempo? O da casa? No? Sì, c'è, c'è, sì? C'è uno. Eccoti, prego. Oh, hi, Mita. Thank you for the talk. So I want to extend what you said about storytelling and the role of storytellers in this situation and also about scientists who are, you know, working on these things. I haven't read your latest book, but have you taken forward some uh, points from interesting research on how, you know, talking about climate change and everything? And the role of scientists as storytellers, because like you said, maybe there are some people who acknowledge science, but in their current form, it's very small. But the collaboration between scientists and storytellers, or you as a storyteller, how do you draw from science and the other way around also? Uh, well, I myself have collaborated uh, with a climate scientist, uh, Adam Sobel of uh, Columbia University. And um, you know uh, we've done various kinds of work together. He's an atmospheric physicist. Uh, but, uh, you know, the scientist uh, who I, I mean, a very, very interesting scientist uh, is a woman called Robin Wall Kimmerer. She's a botanist, uh, but she's a Native American. A nat- she's, so, she's a Native American botanist, but she teaches uh, ecology. Uh, I forget exactly where. And she's written a really, really wonderful book, uh, you know, about her visions of plants and so on. And as she says in the book, you know, uh, two ways of looking at plants can coexist. So as a scientist, she looks at the plant in a certain way, and as a Native Amer- uh, American person, uh, she looks at the plant in a different way. You know, because for Native Americans, uh, the three most important plants are p- for them, uh, there's, uh, I-, I think, pepper, uh, then there's uh, uh, then there's corn. Corn is actually very very important for them. So these are for them like gods, you know. So she can see them in, uh, in in different ways, and I think it's not impossible at all. I don't think having a certain vision, a certain way of thinking, commits you completely to you know a mechanistic view of the world. I mean, if you take for example. Uh, Ramanujan, the great uh, mathematician, uh, you know, he always attributed his his own mathematical skills uh, to his mother, who was a traditional numerologist, you know, uh, for whom uh, you know she saw numbers as gods, you know, and Ramanujan always said that you know he saw uh, these numbers as other than human beings, uh, you know, so you know. These are genuine mysteries, and there are many ways of perceiving these things, which happen, uh, uh, you know, in ways that we can't really just always explain. Who can explain why a great chess player is a great chess player? Bene, dobbiamo lasciare Amitav Ghosh che deve prendere un treno, deve scappare. È stato un bellissimo dialogo, un bellissimo incontro. Grazie ancora, Amitav Ghosh. Aspettiamo presto di nuovo a Padova.